to People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm your host, Kurt Karstensen. Joining me today on episode 12 of the podcast are Dave Berg, Molly Berg, and Ethan Berg. Dave and Molly are 13-year-old Ethan's parents. For the majority of his life, Ethan has had some behavioral issues that have led to many problems with his family, school, teachers, law enforcement, his permanent record, and him being sent away from home at times. And for much of the time I've known the Berg family, I've been aware that this was something that they were dealing with, and last year I had an experience with Ethan that made me question how well I truly understood it, and how I, and perhaps others, might rush to judgment. Today, I bring you three conversations, first with Dave, then with Ethan, and last with Molly, to gain perspective on the Berg family dynamics, and all three participate in my Being Wrong segment. See photos of everyone and interact with the podcast by following the People I Know Show pages on Facebook or Instagram. Now, to the conversations, first with Dave Berg. I'm joined now by Dave Berg. Hello, Dave. Hey, Kurt. Dave, we've worked together for about seven years, so that's how we initially know each other. But we've we spent some time together in some different ways. We've been on a bowling team for the most most of those seven years off and on. I'm you know I'm I'm less of a bowler than you are. You're pretty good. Well, some would say that I used to be. And we've played cards together in a number of occasions. Actually, just prior to us recording today, you were the big winner in the card game. Yeah, I get them once in a while. It's hard to get them from Jim, but I did pull it off today. And we've been in a fantasy football league that you've run for a number of years that I, again, took second place in, and or second place or worse. I never win. Yeah, I remember. So we, we've had a, a number of different social type of situations. So we've gotten to know each other for some time. And I guess the reason specifically on the podcast today why I'm having you, we're, we're friends, you're someone I know, but I've... As I've interacted with you occasionally over the years, I'd, I'd get to know your family a little bit, interact with your family, and know that we have a lovely family. And it's challenging, but yes, it's, it's lovely. That's, well, that's a nice way to put it. It's lovely. A lot, lot of blonde hair and blue eyes. Is everyone blonde hair, blue eyes? Uh, yeah, I guess. I mean, Molly's is now with some treatment, too, so I guess we all are. Okay. Now we're all, we're all equals in that way. So we, we, and I, I'm not, I, some people call me blonde, but I have blue eyes at least. I don't know if this is quite blonde. Yeah. So maybe I could join your family at some point if you, if well, you like. you already got invited to stay overnight by Anakin. So. Yeah. You're, so if you can describe your, your family, your, you and Molly. Yep. I'm married to my wife now for oof, 16 years, been together like 20 years with her. And, uh, we did it kind of, I guess the right way where we met each other and then, in my opinion, at least the right way. She moved She moved in with me. We lived together for four years, and uh, then we got married. Then we got a house. Then we got a dog to see if we could have another living being in our house that didn't die, and we pulled that off. And then three years later, we had our oldest, Ethan, as our first child experience. And then some years later, had a second. Yep. Uh, Cameron is eight now. And then Anakin, it just turned five a couple of days ago. We're going to focus on, well, I guess, what I've observed over the years. We would talk about how things are going. And your oldest son, Ethan, I guess, I don't know, maybe you describe some of the challenges that you would, you would describe to me, the things that you, your family has to deal with. Uh, Ethan was a very, very difficult child. Um, and I know a lot of people say that with their first one, you know, and that's why he went kind of undiagnosed for as long as he did. But he has... Uh, but as it turns out, a frontal lobe disorder that probably came from a very uh, difficult and traumatic childbirth. He was a very difficult forceps delivery, uh, very, very late, and he is very lucky to be with us because of that. Also, there's a thing called an intrathecal that uh, raised his, his uh, body temperature along with Molly's body temperature at the time of childbirth because she got to the hospital uh, in time for the uh, epidural But there was an accident on 169 out on the highway, and the only anesthesiologist they had was tied up with half a dozen people um, that had serious injuries. So by the time he was able to get to the delivery room, it was too late for the epidural. And so this intrathecal that they no longer administer because of the side effects, and and you guys can look that up that are listening. Um, There's a lot of stuff going on with that. Um, 
that raised her body, her, her body temperature and that then raised Ethan's body temperature and that could have done also some damage potentially. I don't know. No one will ever really know. Went to level two and he did survive. They did not have to do a spinal tap, which is what the next thing was. <laughs> Went into a dark room and filled up with 12 people and all this machinery, all these equipment, all this equipment. And they were going to, they were going to do a spinal tap on the infant to find out what diseases he might have because of the fever he was born with. But it turned out, uh, it was just because of the interthecal and luckily our, our, uh, pediatrician knew to call this, uh, whoever his associate was at the children's hospital and find out for sure if that was a possibility from the interthecal causing that, that side effect. And sure enough, and as, just like they, they said, as Molly's temperature went down, then Ethan's temperature went down simultaneously and they didn't have to do any additional procedures at that time. So everyone survived the childbirth. Yep. And then, well, how did moving forward? What what were some he of the early challenges? Very, very if there were some? He had, you know, we thought it was just he just didn't want to listen to us. We thought that you know he, um, you couldn't reprimand him in his first two years of his life without significant consequences. Being like he would completely have these breakdowns where he would. Uh, get so upset with himself, he would hit himself. He would end up throwing up. He would vomit on himself just for being scolded. And it, it, as he got older, that became even more of an issue. Not not the vomiting part, but these these catastrophic breakdowns and breaking things and hurting people. And uh, by the time he got through kindergarten, barely, he got into first grade when they moved him to what's called level two in the education system. And then by second grade, level three, he can tell you more about some of this stuff. He, he remembers it too. Um, and we will talk, I'll talk to him shortly, but to get the parental perspective on some yeah. of the things. So then it was it, having him evaluated in a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists and starting him on medication. He was swallowing his first pills when he was just turning six years old. And there was a while when he was seven where he was on like a dozen pills a day to try to, to just to try to control his behavior because it was, it was so, I'm trying to think of the right word. Getting too old now. I don't want to say they use canatonic. Is that the right word? I don't know. I don't. I, I'm not a thesaurus. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was it, it was pretty bad. And when I say pretty bad, I'm like, oh, my kid is bad too. Like, no. But how many teachers did your kid send to the hospital? How many police officers has your kid harmed? You know, how many? As he got older, you know, how many how many police cars has he damaged? You know, Ethan's is is a long list. That that's that's how it started anyway. Um, by the time he was fourth grade, level four, which is like the highest the education system pretty much provides without going to a full-time hospitalization facility. And we were having, um, by the time he was 10, 11, uh, between three and 10 uh, police calls a week, whether it was from home or from school. Or other people that had come in contact with him as far as his behavior and uh, his volatility. By the time he was 11 years old, by the time he was 11, he uh, he was already charged with uh, a list of, of crimes. Three were felonies, two against his mother for bodily injury. And he was in Carver County Jail for... Oh, this is where it gets like a long, long story. They couldn't house him here in Scott County because they didn't have a facility for him. Um, so they, they shipped him out to Carver County and where he was away on three different occasions, one time for longer than was legally allowed, which we never really made an issue of, but it wasn't safe to send him home and I would not sign the paperwork putting him into foster care. You just <laughs> thought that would be the worst solution? Um, nothing against foster parents and people that do that stuff. I mean, I really appreciate that. But I feel like when people sign on to be a foster parent, to me, that means they're taking over, you know, they're willing to take a child into their home that either has lost the parents or the parents aren't, 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 aren't good parents. Like they can't, they can't at that time anyway, take care of the child. And for me, I knew Ethan and the idea of putting him into somebody else's home sounded like a disaster to me, yeah, especially when I found out like that financially I could be held liable in that situation for anything that he damaged. You know, I'd have to deal with 
uh, emotionally, anybody that he might have hurt. So they needed me to voluntarily sign the paperwork to put him into foster care. And that was the one time I put my foot down with the whole system and all of our court appearances and everything. I said, I will not do that. If you want to take him from us and put him into foster, you can. But you're not going to agree I'm, to it. I'm not going to sign off on it, no. He has a loving family at home and proved to me otherwise. And with all of the child protection, dozens of child protection suits, cases have been open and tons of visits and surprise ones, scheduled ones, therapists, a lot of things for a lot of years. It's, it's probably a lot more, it's probably a lot too much for your podcast here, Kurt. But, um, do I think we're getting the sense so far that challenges beyond what almost anyone faces, but of course, then there's a positive side, certainly. And he's in the room right now as we, as we speak, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk to him in a little bit. Every time I've encountered him, just as likable as any likable kid I've ever come across. And a lot of people say that, and that's absolutely true. He's a really, really good person. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of... Um, hmm, I don't know how to, how to put it. Put it. Um, we don't have a... The, the system isn't good at identifying people that are good people that have serious conditions versus people that just make bad behavior decisions. So that's something we've had to deal with his entire life. And a lot of criticism as parents, a lot of um, uh, even some of the people that have treated him have been criticized for the, for the things that they've done with him because he is just not in the scope of what the system is trained to identify, basically. And so if, if you can... Uh, before I talk to him, like what's, is there been a, a lowest point, a point where you've felt closest to, to, to giving up? What, what, what is that like? And what, what might have caused the point where it's been like, I don't know what else we can do. We've done everything dozens of times and I'm just, I don't know what to do. Well, where does that happen all the time? I don't know. That <laughs> kind of encompasses pretty much our whole lives as parents with Ethan. Um, I guess it came to probably fruition when, when he finally uh, was going to seriously um, go away for an extended period of time. And I made an agreement that he could go to, instead of being shipped out to uh, Louisiana, Kentucky, Maryland has a place. So it'd be like full-time institution places, which is not where Ethan belongs. He needs, he needs support and love, which he, which he has at home. And... I made an agreement that he would go away for, for three months up north to a place called North Homes, which he will be very happy to tell you about. It was a very, very lousy experience for him. Um, but not the treatment facility that everybody thinks that exists. Um, it was very, very horrible, but it, uh, Scott County agreed to it because the program said like that they have all this, all these things available so he can work off all of his probation. He can, you know, he can be facilitated and writing all his apology letters to people and kind of work through the, all of the stuff that's been handed down to him across all of his legal issues. A lot of people think, um, bringing it up that at 11 years old, you can't be charged with a felony. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, like I said earlier, he was charged with a total of three of them. He pled guilty to one. Uh, the other, the other two were dismissed. And the dynamic, I guess, is everybody also says that you get charged when you're underage, especially at that age, that by, when you're an adult, then that record disappears. And that's not true. Um, it, by pleading guilty to the felony, it can disappear when he turns 18, if he handles all of the different things that are handed down to him from the court system by that time, and he has a clean record when he turns 18. If he pleads not guilty and goes to trial and is found guilty, even though he's 11 years old, turning 12, that felony will stay on his record for the rest of his life, as I understand it. But he's home now. He was away for three months. It was a terrible experience. I'm going to have him talk about that. And since that time is... And I and I, I don't understand it myself. He is on less medication now than ever. Uh, as he's hitting puberty here, 13 years old, uh, I had heard that it was going to, all the way through his whole life, it's going to be a whole different ball game when he turns that age and he's going to be more violent. He's got more issues with his emotions. And, and I haven't seen that. I've seen exactly the opposite of that. As he's gotten older, he's gotten a whole lot better. We haven't had a single police call from anybody since he's been back from up north. And how long has that been? One year. 
That's what it's been. Because it's been, uh, and this has probably been the, the best year that we've ever had as parents with Ethan. And, it, and, it, and it's a challenge every day, but it's better than it ever was. So after this, I'll talk to Ethan, but before a potential audience that doesn't know your family, doesn't know your son, hear some talk. Is there anything that you'd like to else to say about Ethan before I, I turn the conversation to him? Something that you, you can't, that, you're not going to know about him from what you've just said and maybe not even from talking to him. Something that's valuable for someone to hear. Uh, not to judge people too quickly. Like Ethan has really come along in a way that a lot of people wouldn't even have thought was possible or given him a chance to. There are people that behave very, very poorly. And I think that people need to understand that it may not be that they're bad people. That there is there there is good in some people that do some very very bad things, and as a society we need we we just need to to, to give a little little space and understand that. Something I do in my my podcast every week it's the being wrong segment. So involving Ethan, involving something else. Is there something that you can look back now and say that you were wrong about? I think that. I was wrong. I think a lot of society is wrong with thinking that there are a lot of resources in place to help children, especially that are struggling at home. And there really aren't. A lot of the numbers of resources, uh, locations that we were given along the way with Ethan either never existed or don't exist anymore. Um, the child psychiatrists that can actually uh, prescribed medications are very, very limited in the state of Minnesota. I think there's only like 22 in the entire state right now we're down wow. to. I learned a lot about that process and why there's a lot of people that, that when they go into psychology and then get a psychiatrist and, and they think that they want to help children, well, there is a whole lot of additionally, additional schooling and training associated with with a child psychiatry and it's very, very expensive to go through it. And by the time you spend that much time in school, you kind of trail off at some point before you get all the way through. And it's hard to find uh, places that have those psychiatrists that you can see. Uh, we have been turned down by a couple of them when they get uh, Ethan's case file, when they say originally that they do have room and we get help from our Scott County uh, um, advocates. Um, and you get there and they get they, they get that that case file and they see the the severity of it and how big it is and decline it because it's it's just too much to take on. Well, thank you Dave for joining me and uh we'll be back here in a second with your son Ethan. Thanks Dave. Thanks Kurt. I'm now joined by Ethan Berg. Hello Ethan. Hi Kurt. Ethan, remind me how old you are. I'm 13. 13 in what grade? Eighth. Eighth grade. So I've met you a few times over the years just to be at your, your parents' house. We have a card game or something, maybe a, a fantasy football draft. Met you a few times and interact with you a lot. Always been pleasant interactions, but I guess I kind of knew some of the things that your dad told me about that you've, you've had some difficulties and you know I never saw it. It was kind of strange. So I, I imagine you remember this last year. Your family and I, coincidentally, were at Treasure Island Casino, and I think you guys, what do you go when you're there? You go to the water park and do different things. Mm -hmm. And then your mom had mentioned, "Hey, you want to go bowling with Ethan or something like that?" And I'd had like these other plans of like there's a bunch of people that I knew that were there. I'm like, I want to do all these things. I'm like, um, yeah, I'll go. I mean, because you didn't have any friends with you, your brothers are with you, but you didn't have no one your age. And she asked me because she knew me, so I thought, okay, I'll go bowling with Ethan. It'll take an hour or whatever. We'll go have a little fun. So we went there, and then you, as you might recall, they had like an hour or so wait before we even started bowling. So then I didn't know you that well. I'm 34 at the time, 35, and you're, when's your birthday? What month? January. So I guess you were, you were 13 at that time. And it's like, what am I going to do with this kid that I don't know very well for an hour or so? But we ended up, I got a deck of cards and we just played some card games and we talked and over that hour or so, I realized, wow, I really like this kid. And then as the more I talked to you, the fact that I knew these problems that you've experienced and that you, you deal with, your family deals with exists. It just, it, as we have the being wrong segment, it's one of the examples from my past year. I'm like, 
I was wrong. Like somehow I had some kind of perception of you that wasn't accurate. So we ended up going bowling and we had a fun time. And that was my first time I ever bonded with you. So as I went through the year, had this, this podcast, I thought at some point I should talk to Ethan because I just somehow it didn't, it didn't work in my mind the reality that you're all experiencing and how I might have perceived it as an outsider. So your dad's already talked about a few things about your, your background, but I, I guess for someone that's never met you, someone that doesn't understand maybe your situation, can you describe what it's like to be the aspect of you that I've gotten to know a little bit and I really like, and then also have this version of yourself that has a lot of issues? I guess describe, describe, describe yourself if you can. Well, that's kind of hard because it kind of always depends. I don't know. I could just go mad. Like when I get mad, I just do stuff. And then when I'm happy, I'm just like this, I guess. I don't really know how and to explain it. So maybe that, that short transition from being happy to something causing you to react in the way that you do. Is there something that you're feeling inside of you as it's building up? Can you, I don't know, I don't know if you can put that into words. Um, I don't know. Just think about like a kind of like a volcano. It's calm, but it can explode. So this it can still, I don't know, explode when it needs to, when it happens. So this volcano is you in this case, and I don't think there's any way that I or humans know how to stop a volcano from erupting when it's about to. Is that kind of what's happening to you? Like it's about to happen and there's no stopping it? Mm, yeah, I guess. Um, over the time, though, I've been able to control it better, I would say. But before, I could not stop it. If it came, it came. That was it. So it came, and, and this, this happened. Are your memories as of these moments as sound when something's happening as normal time, or is it your memories not always the same? Oh, I remember a ton of it, maybe even all of it. But I just make the memory kind of fade because... I just don't really like remembering, you know, mm -hmm. like to move forward instead of remembering what happened and take that on what's now instead of future. It's like what happened in the past. I want to keep it that way. I don't want to have it in the present, maybe in the future because of it. So even it happened, make, it's over. Making that comment, you sound like wise beyond your years. I don't know that most kids can even talk like that. Maybe they can, but that sounds like you're trying to do your best to deal with a version of yourself that maybe is, you know, you're not, not as happy about. And I think, I think all people deal with that with certain things, but I guess with the, the, that, that aspect of you, it's caused a lot of problems for yourself and for your family. So what's, I guess, what's that like knowing that you're this volcano that erupts occasionally and it causes problems for everybody? I don't know. I just try to try not to do it. If it doesn't happen, nothing to worry about. And so I just try to, you know, if anything, I'll like, if I get mad, I just try to calm down, go in my room because I have a door that's shut and locks. So I shut it and lock it, just hang out in my room, isolate, and usually it's gone. It just and, vanishes. And this is a newer, newer tactic, newer skill that you've used in recent years? Yep. And it's, So, okay, I, actually, I was at your house yesterday, and I think maybe I saw a version of this. Because you've got two younger brothers. And I think any family, most families that have a number of kids, occasionally the kids fight and you and one of your brothers were, you know, interacting like brothers and it escalated and you got very angry very quickly mm -hmm. and I witnessed it. Um, but then you did leave the room and it kind of just stopped and went away and you came back later. So three years ago, would have that ended the same way? Or no. What would have happened, you think? Um, I would have hurt people, hurt broken things because I didn't know the skill that I do now. Like I knew it, I just didn't use it. I never realized what happens if you sit there and let it happen rather than getting away from it. So you learned how to maybe not be calm in that moment, but get yourself out away of the from moment, it, out away from the moment. Yeah. Like if I'm in it, if I can give myself, like, imagine a box, if it's inside the box, if I can get myself outside the box and come back later, then nothing happens. Before, I would sit there and stuff would happen. 
So I'd stay in the box and I could go out of it. If that makes sense. It does make sense. So in the last, your dad said about the last year since you returned after living away for a while, they've had no incidents that maybe rise to the level that previous things have had. And it's, is it because of this tactic? No, it's just because mostly because I don't want to go back to what, where I've been so terrible. I don't want to ever go back. So if I'm good and I just deal with it, I don't have to go back and that would just make me happy. So it's like a win for everybody if I just don't let it happen. Okay. Can you describe why that was such a terrible experience or some of the, some of the things that happened that made it so terrible for you? Oh yeah. Um, that people have wrecked my stuff. I have probably over 200, $300 worth of stuff that was wrecked there by kids ripping it up or spraying water on it or peeing on it. They've even peed on it. Um, they've poured water on me when I was sleeping constantly. So I'd wake up wet. All my clothes are wet waking up because of these kids throwing water on me for no reason and just doing all this stuff to me. Like, it's just me. Like, I don't know why they, they don't do it to each other. They do it to me for some reason. I didn't understand that one bit. Did you have previous negative interactions? Like, what would like would you say that them doing these things to you was the first negative interaction involving you and that person, or did something happen before that? It where wasn't they really. You? It wasn't really one specific person. It was just all these kids. I don't know. It was always different because they just didn't want me to have stuff or something. I don't know. They just would always pick on me. Like they would team up and pick pick on me as well. I, I've had so much stuff wrecked. I've had my shirt, shirts ripped up in pieces and strips. I've had my, ma my magic cards and like trading cards and stuff rip, ripped up and wet and everything. And it's just like, I don't understand. I never got it. Did, so just trying, I'm trying to step back and think, okay, they're doing these bad things to you. Did you do anything that would have made them, them or other people? Like, were, were you doing any bad things there? Would um, you say? Yes, I would in like these other places when people would pick on me, I'd do stuff, I'd retaliate. But mostly I would get away from the situation and when they, these people and stuff would come, come at me after I, like if I'm outside the box and they come outside the box to bother me, that's when I would retaliate because there's no reason to be out, be bothering me out here. I got away from the situation, you're going to come out here and bother me, so I'm going to do stuff to you. Like there's no reason. So you would... Was this a situation where you'd remove yourself from situations, but then they they tracked you down and to escalate it further? Yeah. And some of the kids would have bruises and stuff because they wouldn't leave me alone. They know I left the room and they would follow me and there's no reason for it. So then I'd hurt them because just like get them away and I'd get in trouble. I'd be like, okay, fine, because I was doing what I needed to do, get away from the situation. He followed me. That's not my fault. So you... So we're, we're, at least I'm beginning and someone listening is beginning to understand some of the, the issues that you've had or dealt with. Did you get to know about the other kids there and, and like how your situation compared to them in any way or what, why they were there? Um, yeah, I know some of them. Really don't know if I should say them though, but yeah, I've heard some pretty bad cases while I was there, but never really understood why they attack me like they do. It made no sense whatsoever because I wouldn't even do anything to them. I would not do anything. They looked at me, thought I was mean or something for no reason, just by looking at me and attacked me. And that was it. How many, about how many kids were at this place and what was the age range roughly of how old everybody was? There's from like eight, nine kids to 17, 18. And it would fluctuate depending on when someone would come or someone would be sent home or somewhere else? Yep. And the fact that all of you were there, there was there was behavior problems in some way that got you all sent there. Is that correct? Yeah. So, or yes. Yeah, so, all in their own ways. All, but I never had anybody that actually was like linked to me, like had anything to do with what I have done. What I was, what's wrong, what was wrong with me. So you all different... Unre maybe unrelated behavior problems when you're there. So like, I've never been to a place like this. You've obviously experienced it for a few months. And I think it's a, it's a very interesting perspective. So how, from your perspective being there, how did, how would have 
having nine or 18 kids with different behavior issues together, how would that be good for anyone? Like, what did you see? What were they doing there that made this a good idea? Well, I wouldn't say it was ever a good idea because they had these rooms, like bedrooms that had two beds each. So it was like two kids in each one of these rooms with doors that don't lock or anything. And the showers, no doors, no nothing. Their stalls, no nothing. Like it was like if you were in the bathroom and somebody else were to go in there, you'd have no privacy. Mm -hmm. Um, There was no privacy whatsoever and everybody was just together. And the staff would just sit there and advise it and make sure like there's no fights, but that's it. That's all they would do. And if there's something, if there's like bullying in a room, they don't go check it. They didn't. The only time they would check is during the night, and that's it. So, would you say that of the kids that are there at any one time, were some of them somewhat respectful, or was everyone kind of an antagonist trying to cause problems some of the time? Well, they were all like that. I, I found, I think, one kid who understood me and where I come from and wouldn't pick on me. But since we, me and he, the guy would, were smaller, so it was like we couldn't defend ourselves, really. If he got attacked, I'd get attacked, too, because we're this, you know, we're not any bigger than they. And, I, and if we were bigger than them, they wouldn't have touched us because the bigger kids don't get picked on. It's only the ones that are smaller that get to deal with the stuff. So you're not a big kid, but maybe for your ad I'm not sure how you compare for someone your age, but in that setting, that might not matter. But I've, as I've heard from your dad that you've, you've caused damage and harm in other ways. So are you able, if, if you were to have an altercation with someone bigger, are you, are you able to defend yourself or in that type of a setting, you're not? There's no defense. If anything, maybe you'd get this, maybe the staff would come help, but usually not. And because of it, you can't do nothing. You can't do nothing to stop it. You can't. Do nothing to save yourself. Nothing. Nothing you could have done. So it's just like sit and suffer or retaliate. It was the two options. So you, as I think you stated, your dad said, you, do, you don't want to go back there. Definitely. I guess the thought comes to me of, so that was that the first situation you've been in where, I don't know, you weren't the most, potentially the most violent person? Like, I guess some of the other things that have been described that you, you, you know, whatever issues that you've been involved with where people maybe couldn't control you at times, but there, there was kids that were more uncontrollable than you. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know the staff, if they needed to, they could take down the kids like that are bullying and stuff. Like when I first got there, they were doing a fine. They were doing well. You know, the, no fights because of it, because of the staff. And But once the staff, like, um, I guess, don't pay attention as much, they start not paying attention toward the end of my time there. And so that's when the more bullying and more stuff happened because there's no cameras, there's no nothing. There's nothing to record or anything of what, what's happening in the rooms or anything. So once I, the, the, there's a little, I think, a little piece of glass maybe on the doors and that was it. So if you don't see through that glass, you're not seeing anything that's going on in the room. So that people could be in my room wrecking my stuff and they wouldn't see nothing because there's no cameras or nothing. Would there be problems every day, most days? Every day. There was something every day. Not entirely with me right away when I first got there, but there was something every day for sure. So when you eventually left and came back home, what was that like to, to be able to leave there knowing that you weren't going to be there anymore? I kind of like celebrated. I like <laughs> I went in my room and you know, um, went back and I laid down and just took a nap because of how just like once I got home I just literally just took a nap because of how tired and everything that stuff was. And it was nice to be able to lay in my own bed at the time. So did you feel like for those three months you were on guard basically the whole the whole time and couldn't even sleep comfortably? And, and then right when I walked in the door I was like, oh my gosh, so relaxed. It was so much more relaxed right when I walked in the door of our house. I, I remember. I remember how tense I was all the time. Got home, walked in the door, and all of a sudden, I just it just was gone. 
without even trying. Like just naturally, all the tension, tension, everything just left. So do you think the last year has been one of the or the best year then of your life so far just for maybe your mindset coming out of that? Yeah, definitely. It was pretty decent, yeah. And you've been back at school, and I'd imagine most of the kids in school are aware of some of the issues that you've had in the past, or maybe not. You can explain about that. But what's it like being back in school this past year? And I've actually been trying to get out of this level four. I'm actually working my way to mainstream because of how much I hate that level four. So technically, I'm almost going to be a regular kid again. So you say you're not a regular kid yet. I guess I didn't quite understand that. So what what's your day like when you're at school? Do my work with my head like out of everything because the other kids like to po- point out if you're doing something you're not supposed to or whatever. And I just sit there and with my, you know, doing what I got to do to with my work and ignore the kids. If I don't, if I can't ignore them, um, they start doing stuff once they know that you can't ignore anymore. So it's, even though it's not as severe as it was when you're up north, it's still kind of constant kids trying to, other kids trying to make your day miserable. miserable. Yes. Um, yeah, it is. And that's why I'm kind of getting, trying to get in mainstream because, um, once I get in there, I can get away from those kids. And once I'm away from those kids, there's really no kids that can really bother me because everybody doesn't, because when you're in mainstream, you don't got kids that really annoy you as much as they would in level four. So I'm trying to take the perspective. So if the other kids are, you know, you feel like they're trying to make your day miserable. Do you ever do anything to, to mad, try to make other kids miserable? Oh, no, I don't sit there and pick at them. No, of course not. I'm trying to get my way in mainstream. And if I did that, I wouldn't be getting there. So you don't do that now. Did you ever do that? No, I'd really just retaliate with what they did to me. So you're someone So maybe, I guess, for me, knowing you how I do, you, normal kid, good kid, but if other kids, other people... Sit there and bother me, bother me, bother me, yes, I start getting... Like it's like the fueling of the volcano at that point when people just keep on bothering me. And eventually, if they keep doing it, I erupt. And that's it. I just... I can't really explain otherwise. So I can look back to my life. And I was picked on more than I would have liked. And I never felt good. I was never someone that reacted in the way, I don't think ever like violently, but I know what it's like to to be picked on and, and not like it. So I guess, and I'm sure most people have experienced this in some way, and it's just that for you in those situations, it just, it builds up and does it build up quickly then? Not necessarily, I guess. Like if I'm having a good day, like I want to keep it good. I, it might not bother me at all, but if there's a day like, you know, I'm like a little bit more tired than usual and everything, it'll bottle up way faster than it w- ever would. Does it matter if you have a history with the person that's doing it? No, because some of the kids that are there are ones that I met when I first started there. I have, there's one kid left there that's still there from when I first got there and me and him get along just well because we know each other for so long. But you haven't caused problems with each other? Definitely not. We but know it, each other really I, well. I guess we like I'm, helping each other rather than hurting each other because of how long we've been there and how long we got to know each other and all that. So is he one of your better friends? He's one of the, like he's, yeah, he's definitely one of the better friends. He's one of all, he's one of the biggest kids too. So it's like when you have one of the biggest kids to help you. <laughs> That's good. Most people don't bother you, okay. <laughs> which is kind of nice. I guess. Yeah. I guess the reason I asked that history question, because I was with you yesterday and your one of your brothers was doing brotherly things. And because I, I think I asked you the question, if I did the same thing that if I did the same thing that he was doing to you, would have it bothered you? And you responded, no, because it was me. But because it was your brother, you reacted in a certain way. So I guess I'm just trying to understand, is it the thing? Is it the person? Is it the combination of of what's happening, who's doing it and what they're doing or... Or, or not. I guess I'm just trying to get a better understanding of that. Well, I mean, if you're around somebody that's constantly bothering me, for me, it's like if I'm around somebody for a long time and they start picking on me, it's way easier to retaliate because I've, it's been happening for so long. But even with adults, I guess it's just harder. It, I just don't retaliate with adults because 
I don't know. They're just adults. I don't mm-hmm. know how to explain it. I just don't have it. So to clarify something, you when you say mainstream in level four, part of your day is in level four and part of your day is in mainstream? Yes. And I worked hard to get it that way. It was just level four for like till 12 or one when I started because I like, when I was on half days at the level four, it made everything so much easier. I was able to get through it. But once I was able to control it, I was I did really well. I got to full days in that. I went through the rest of the year on full days. And then the next year is when I started um doing half, like half, not really half, but part day in level four and part day in mainstream. What what do you need to do? How long before you can get back to full mainstream? Has it been told to you what, what you need to show or demonstrate? I'm pretty sure I'm getting more classes in either right when we go back to school or after the meeting on January 20th, I believe. Okay. So it's it's going to improve even more very soon if things stay the same. If I keep doing well, yes. Okay. Let's talk about not that. Not not the things that have been struggles for you, but what you're a 13-year-old kid and my experiences with you have been great. So describe your describe yourself or the things that you enjoy as a 13-year-old. I mean, it's pretty easy because um, I like doing video games and it makes it easy to be able to record what I'm doing on like YouTube and go to do Twitch and all that. And it just, it helps me because like um, that way I can do what I like have fun doing and still have people watching the stuff you know because when you see the when i see the views and stuff it makes me so happy because like that means people are watching they're you know sort of liking it and stuff and i really like that because it makes it seem like i'm actually doing something good for a change like i'm doing what i want to do for fun and end up having people like this stuff what's your the youtube channel i'll i'll make sure i put it in the the episode show notes so people can click on the link but what is it called so maybe a few more people will Show up and see what you got going on? I spell it a certain way, though, so that's, you know, it's not like you can find anywhere else. It's, um, if all you got to type up is, um, Fortnite winner with the E's are threes, and then it'll say, like, for, and you type that up, it'll be like Fortnite winner every day with threes as E's, and, it, and that's, if you click that, it'll be my channel. Right there. Okay. Well, I will link to that for someone that wants to click and check it out and give you some more views. But Fortnite winner every day, every E is actually a three. Yes. Okay. All the E's in that in that sentence are threes. Yes. That's creative. Is, is that something you came up with on your own? Yeah. I just thought I, I wanted to make something that's like, if you look it up, it's not like all these different people that have the, close to that name come up instead of, you know, instead of having that happen if i have it my own unique name that like nobody else has you can click it and it'll be right there in all of it and not just part of other things very cool what's what's it like for you whether it's in like video games online or in real life making friends that you know as a 13 year old with some of the things you've gone through what's friend making like for you oh friend i can and you can you can ask my dad and mom i make friends easy really easy actually it's keeping the friends that I that is hard for me. I don't know why, but like I can go up to a random kid sometimes and be like, "Hey, you want to be a friend and everything?" And yeah, that'll work. But I mean, that may last a week and and then we won't be friends anymore. Will so, you be not friends or just kind of lose touch? I guess there's kind of a difference. Sometimes you lose touch with people. Sometimes it's both. It depends on the person, really. Okay, and. Your best friendships, describe what makes them good friendships from your perspective. What's what's a good friend to you? Um, one that likes to hang out. People that like to hang out and like want to play with me all the time. Like you want to hang out all the time and do stuff we and like do stuff we both like and everything, I guess. Mm-hmm. Instead of having a kid that, you know, you think you're friends with, but really they like this and you like that, you know, that doesn't work out. And I think one thing I've learned over life is friendship as at different ages and points of your life, it, it changes. Like what you really deem a friendship and certainly people come into life at all stages and 
the real friends will last and you can't really search for them. They just, they kind of stick around because of whatever qualities that you appreciate in each other. So hopefully you, you keep on making friends and, and make a few of those for the long run. Your 13 now has been, has been established. What, and now things have gotten better. I think it, from what I can understand, as you look forward to the upcoming couple of years ahead, maybe someday once you're like 18 and move out of the house or whenever you move out of the house, what, what do you see for your future? Do you think about that? Um, yeah, a lot actually, because like, um, like my YouTube, I've always liked. And so I do that. But in the past, I've always wanted to be an engineer. Like I've always wanted to make like toys for kids. And, and over the time now I've been wanting to make like a portal, like a different, and interdimensional portal that puts me into like a Pokemon world because I've always liked Pokemon so much and I've wanted to make like something that I could be able to go in and experience like firsthand like in real life so is this works. virtual reality or somehow reality like actual reality like I could go out and just become like in the like in the show and in the game and all that so this is something that you'd like to create yes Interesting. Very much. Have you read on this topic? Is there there are other people working on it right now? Because I'm not. I don't know if I even quite understand it exactly. But this is. I, I like the fact that you have this idea. So um, I doubt there's anybody doing it because of how much physics and mechanical stuff you're going to need for it. So I really doubt it. But I feel like I could make it work somehow. <laughs> Good. And if I believe, I should be able to achieve it. Think right. If yeah, if you're motivated for that, you'll and you can work towards it. Every every step that you can take towards it is is progress. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to see that happen because I, it would blow my mind. That's for sure. Yeah. One observation through through this podcast, some of the previous episodes. I know you've listened to some. I'm not sure if you listened to any of them where I talked about this, but I now have the belief that that we we don't have like free will. Our brain our brain is causing all these reactions. They're not causing. We have these reactions that are constantly happening that sometimes we feel like we can do something different. We feel like we should be in control, but it, we, we really struggle to be in control. And I think the science, the science that's out there, to me, proves that we're not in control of anything. Our brain is reacting constantly to everything around us. So I guess that's another reason I thought, what you've dealt with is is interesting because I'm aware that the frontal lobe of the brain is is an important aspect, and that even through like age 25, I think most people are still developing that area, and boys especially that trouble causing boys, quote unquote, stop being trouble causers somewhere in the mid 20s because their frontal lobe changes. It's the science behind I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is as we get older, this gets easier at some point. But all of it, though, we can't even control anything. So you know you have these things that you struggle with, but ultimately in those moments, you may be prior to the moment you've learned to step away, but in those moments, do you have control or do you feel like you've, you've lost entire control? Oh, I'm not there. And... Sometimes I so not be there. It'd be like I could. I literally am not like in my like. I'm just not in my like self. I guess like I'd be like playing in a pool or you know or certain or maybe it's like part of J deja vu kind of thing where I would be like doing something and all of a sudden I literally be like a cu like a couple feet in the air looking down on myself in these certain situations. Like I'm that high out kind of thing like where like I don't know if you ever seen this kind of stuff but like when people like get their soul gets knocked out of their body and they're like looking down on themselves and all that yeah, well that will happen to me like, like that's I'm, how it's portrayed in a movie but that's what you've experienced in these moments but what it feels I, like. th I swear those are like true because like it's happened to me like that kind of stuff has happened like I could feel my, I could s somehow feel down here but it, I literally could not see through my own eyes. And to me, I, I don't think I've experienced that in that way. But with this belief that I have that we don't have free will, we have an illusion of free will 
that all we really are doing, we're just watching the movie of our lives. It feels like we're in it. We feels like we're the director sometimes, but in reality, we're not. And we just are constantly reacting to our surroundings. And some people react differently. And you, maybe because... If Almost you're, like a puppet. In a way. Like one of those like puppets with the big handles. Like the brain is, is in control of the handles. And sometimes we feel like we can move ourselves. We can do our own thing. But ultimately, the brain gives us responses that we know a part of, part of our conscious self and our other thoughts know like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But we do it anyhow. Stupid, silly example today. We were playing cards, Dave and I, at our friend's house. And like every time I had a minute, I would go into the kitchen and eat like chips and salsa. It's like a weird addiction. Like I know I shouldn't eat that. I, I, I'm trying to eat healthy. But in those moments, I just, I just like stand up, walk there, eat it. And it's like, no, I shouldn't do this, but I do it anyhow. And that's very basic. It's not what you're maybe dealing with at that level. But People have, I think people lose control in moments where they, they know better, but they do it anyhow. So as you're describing yourself and these things, I'm like, if, if what I believe is true, you're just experiencing it to an extreme level that brings a lot of attention to you and makes maybe people think that you're a bad kid, but ultimately your brain reacts more severely and negatively than the average person. That is entirely right. Yeah, I would definitely put it that way. And I can tell that you're a good kid because I've spent time with you. And I, I like the version of you that your brain's not pulling you in some other direction. I know. Very likable and smart kid. So as a smart 13-year-old, I would like you to participate in the being wrong segment. Is there something that you can look back on now where you thought you knew something and then later were proved to be wrong? Um, so I guess when I was going to level two, I remember, um, when I first got kicked out of that first school, I was going to level two and I was like, I don't know when at the time that I was not there, I was confused of what would it look like? Like I've always had this imagination of what, what level two and all these different places that I've been through before I get there, what they look like. Like, I don't know. Just one of the things I've always like realized. Like, would it look like this? Would it look like that? And I was like, I still remember when I was first, when I first was having to go to level two, I thought it was like a big hallway in a building that had a whole bunch of doors and a couple stairways right by, you know, a jail cell kind of thing where there's a rocking chair and maybe like a carpet across the floor. A um, couple, you know, kids like me sitting there, teacher would come in, read a book, sit in that rocking chair, read a book to us and walk out the door and... You'd have to sit there until they come back around like next 30, an hour later that they would come back. And and I still remember that's exactly what I would see, what I saw before I saw the building and how the place really looked. I don't know. I just like to prepare myself for what could potentially be what it looks like, but I just never got it right. And so what did it look like? It just looked like a normal school that I was just at, just different. And I didn't really think about that. In that way, I never did. I just thought of, the, like, the worst it could be, I guess. So if I if it's the worst, I can prepare myself. And if it's easier, then I know that, I just, that it's just over. Like, I don't have to worry. So this thinking was helpful to you? Yeah, because it helped me prepare if it's, like, super, super shut down or instead of something that's open and big. Because if I can, get, you know, prepare myself for the worst... The easiest that comes is way easier to get through because I already prepared myself for the worst. And how how might this thinking continue to help you in the future? Have you if you do you continue to experience similar similar thoughts to this? I don't know. It just happens all the time. I guess I've always wondered like what stuff looks like, and I just imagine the worst so I can you know prepare for the worst and not have to worry about the best. So in some of the cases, you're, you're ultimately maybe you're wrong because the way you imagine it, but you're also, it sounds like using a tactic to, to set your expectations very low so that. So if it's not, if it's something that's pretty bad, I still thought it was worse than it really was. Yeah. So that, that's good. I, I've learned a few years ago to set my expectations low whenever I can. And when I don't set them low, if I have my expectations, ultimately they're going to, the reality is like, not going to be as good. And then it just it makes my mind, it makes, puts me in a bad mood, basically. What I've always thought was like getting your hopes up is never a good thing because all they can do is get let down. Exactly. So if you have, 
your hopes down, all they can do is go up. It's better to go up than down, I realized. Yes, but I, I would add this caveat of, I, there's a, an author a few years ago, a, a military gentleman that I think uh, had, a, had a disease and ended up passing away from it, but he, he used this phrase, high aspirations, low expectations. So you want to visualize what's possible, but expect kind of the bare minimum and using that combination of, of thought. And I'll, find, I'll, figure, I'll figure out who that was and I'll also post that in the show notes because I don't remember it right now. But visualizing what could be good, but also kind of expecting it to not be good is, is maybe a good way to... Because I think if you always expect it to be bad, that maybe is more of a negative mentality. But if you have the awareness of what could be good, but just be prepared for it not to be as good as you'd like it to be, there's maybe a balance there. Something like that. Yeah, exactly. So, Ethan, thank you for sharing your story with me today. Thank you, Kurt. Molly Berg joins me now. Hello, Molly. Hi. Thank you for chatting with me. So, we're in a discussion about your family a little bit and maybe mostly the, the challenges that your oldest son, Ethan, has has presented to your family. So if you can uh, kind of think back on these 13 now, when was the, the first time that you, you recognized that things might be a little bit different with Ethan than, than you were told when you were having a kid, how things would go? Um, I know Davey has always said like when he would, when Ethan would get in trouble and he would put him in his crib, say at like 18 months old and he would cry so hard that he would make himself throw up. Like, it doesn't seem normal, but it's your first kid. You're like, maybe it's normal. Um, but then that continues into the twos and the threes and the fours. And that's definitely not a reaction that a four-year-old would have because they're upset about something. Like, yes, temper tantrums, but not so much that you're throwing up. Um, and other, like, daycare issues as far as same thing, getting so upset over minor things, uh, not getting the blue block, not getting the blue crayon or whatever the color is that he wants. Um, you don't really know, especially on your first one, that that's not like, yeah, kids are dramatic in what they want because they don't know how to control and think think things through that. This isn't, this is, yes, he's a kid and yes, they're going to act this way, but this is like above and beyond. Um, and we saw our first psychiatrist, child psychiatrist, when he was five. Uh, he was in kindergarten and tearing the room apart as a kindergartner and scaring the teacher and having the teacher leave the classroom with all the kids for the safety. What was that like being the mom of the kid that was the the difficult kid and maybe by far the difficult kid in, in these classes or these settings. It's more of a, what do you do? It's not, I wouldn't say embarrassing. It's not, it's more of a, what do I do to fix this so, to make it better? Like, does he need pills? I'm not, don't really want to put my five-year-old on pills, but if that's what needs to happen, that's what needs to happen. Um, I'd say that's, you know, that's clearly not normal to have your kid throwing scissors at the teacher. No. So as you were looking for answers, would you be getting answers? And how often would these answers actually be effective for Ethan? So our first psychiatrist, child psychiatrist was Dr. Whitmore. And he was actually supposed to retire I think it was about five years before he saw us. And the reason he stayed on is because he knows there's not the help that needs to be for the kids, which is surprising with as many autistic kids and ADD and ADHD and all these other problems that there isn't more help available for them. Ethan ha doesn't have any of those. He's not on the autistic spectrum. Um, we went through, there's this um, doctor's book that's like a foot thick. It's like DSVM. And I think we were looking at the fifth one. And it has, if you are showing, say, out of these 10 symptoms and you're showing at least seven, that means that you have it. 
And we were reading like autistic things. We were reading ADHD things. We were reading all these different um, things that he could be diagnosed with. And all of it was like, no, like there was maybe one here and one there. And we get to ODD, which is oppositional defiance disorder. And we were like, yes, 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 yes. I think the only there was one on the list that wasn't a yes. And the one on the list is the difference between him being ODD and him being psychotic. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember off the top of my head what it was. Or it was about, um, like, you've wronged me and I'm going to get you back no matter what. And that was the only difference between him being just ODD and him being psychotic. And he still, I still don't think he has that to this day. So that, con that ODD is maybe the condition that best explains it, but you don't yes. think it's actually the condition. No, that's, that explains him in a nutshell. Okay, okay. And then they've also added DMDD, which is dysregulated mood, something disorder. Like essentially it's bipolar, but they don't call it that in kids this young. Um, so he has an oppositional defiance disorder where he is oppositional to you where you can say the sky is blue and he'll say, no, it's purple. And he's going to argue with you until the end of time about it. So a lot of times in our house, we just give up and like, okay, yep, the sky's purple because it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. And it's hard raising two other kids where you have a set of rules for this kid because you don't want him to fly off the handle and you don't want him to get aggressive and punch holes in walls and all the rest of it. But yet you have to have, I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old as well, and I can't have them acting out. They need ramifications for things. They need, quote unquote, a regular upbringing that, and for them to see like, well, it's not fair that he gets to X, Y, Z. Nope, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. It isn't. And they're younger, so it's probably harder for them to understand. The eight-year-old is starting to get it and coming around like, nope, it's not fair, but I'm not that person. And he's a good kid. He's mm -hmm. not to say he doesn't goad the bear, so to speak, egg him on because he's a brother. Yep. It's his job. Um, but to bring it down a notch because this brother has a lot, you know, has a lot more anger right there at the surface than say a regular. And he's also 13. Like think about what a holes we were at 13. Like you, me across the board. I don't have much memory of exactly how I was at 13, <laughs> but maybe you were an a hole at 13. I don't know. Mom. I was, I was. <laughs> and how many siblings do you have? If you have any, I have a sister. So you, you remember, I, you're seeing the dynamics in your sons that represent yep. similar to what you experienced. So not that much of it probably surprises you. Right. Like, so where is the line between normal and not normal? Like, yes, they're going to egg each other on. Yes, they're going to, um, you know, tumble about the three boys. They're going to tumble about, make noise, uh, wrestle around, but, you know, punching a hole in the wall because, you know, I took the last marshmallow. It's that's too much, you know, and like trying. So trying to find the line and keep the peace and, you know, still be a mom. How would they're currently 13, eight and five? How would mm -hmm. this age, this this day and age compared to previous ones? How are we doing oh now compared gosh. to the past? Well, Internet has surely taken over Fortnite has beyond taken over and with the dances and the fights like these two my older two i don't let the five-year-old play but the older two play and the fights they get into about i'm better at it than you are and you're a hacker and you cheated and it's a game and maybe we should do dishes or maybe we should do something else for a little bit so because <laughs> they're they're being exposed to like this video game and their, their opinions are getting stronger on, on different things, or I guess explain you brought that up. Why, why? So is it that much worse now in those ways? I'd say so. And the instant gratification of, I can call you not you personally, but like I can say you're a piece of crap, but I'm not saying it to your face. I'm just saying it like to the nether reaches uh -huh. and I don't have the ramifications of seeing your, the look on your face of be like, Oh, well, I don't think I'm a piece of ass. Like, why would you say that to me? Like there's no ramifications for what you say. You just say it 
and it goes. And now when it comes back, you're confused. Cause I know Ethan especially gets that a lot where it's like, he'll say some stuff to somebody online and they'll say it back. And he's just like floored. Like, where did this come from? Like, well, you just said it to somebody. Well, I didn't mean it. Well, they don't know Mm -hmm. because there isn't that. There's just this another of I can say whatever I want without ramifications. The social dynamics of of the faceless person behind a screen somewhere and interacting with that and bringing to the real world is, yeah, I think we all kind of deal with that. But most of us, at least people our age, we dealt with it. We've learned it as an adult, but I, I never really thought about kids that age interacting with people in that way learning so that, constantly learning that now that i can say whatever i want to say and there's no ramifications i can be this idiot behind a computer behind a keyboard and say xyz terrible things and there isn't the i'm saying it to your face and getting that feedback right away off your face of geez that was hurtful maybe i should watch what i say so it's it's probably a, a can of worms that you couldn't put back in anyhow, but is mm-hmm. the video games and the technology overall a, a positive or a negative? Because I I guess my observation, it, it seems like when everyone's kind of doing their thing, things are very calm in, in your household. Everyone's got their game they like. Right. Everyone's happy. Right. And when everyone has to interact with each other or gets to for a while, something tends to potentially develop. So I guess right. how how do you weigh all that? Well, that's where Xfinity, plug for them, comes in. And we have an app that I can turn off Wi-Fi. I have bedtime set. I have uh, rules in place. When I need help with something and I've told them three times, Wi-Fi gets turned off. So with a push of a button, I can turn it off now. I can set for bedtimes. I can... So instead of taking their device for them, you just turn it off and their device is useless. Yeah. Which is probably easier than... You can play Parcheesi by yourself, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So moving forward now, so 13-year-old, 8-year-old, 5-year-old, as you're looking to make things as healthy and well for everyone, as anyone with children would be, what because of some of the dynamics you have in your family, what are you looking at towards the future to make things better and better? Any, any things that you've been applying? Any ideas? I guess I, don't, I just don't know what your situation would be like as you want to make sure that the, the next five years with all three of them together at least go as well mm-hmm. as possible? Um, I don't know. Uh, Ethan has been telling Davey that he doesn't need to go to school because he's going to be a YouTuber and that's going to be his job and how he makes money. So just kind of reinstilling like, no, you have to go to school. That's your thing right now. Um, if you choose to not go to school, that's fine. But then you're not going to have Wi-Fi. You're not going to have like all the amenities, so to speak, the extras that he has. Um, he has an iPad and he just got a tablet from one of the grandmas at Christmas and he has an Xbox. So if you're not going to school, you're not going to have those things. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, you can be a YouTuber if you want at 18 when you know what I mean? On your own. Yeah. Maybe on the side, maybe as a side gig, but there are things that you got to do like for knowledge alone. Do you have to go to school? And I, I'm, I imagine that's not just him that has these ideas. Oh. I think now that's, and maybe there's a time back in history where, you know, regular people would see actors making movies and making a bunch mm-hmm. of money and athletes. And that was the way that people became rich and famous. And now anyone with Wi-Fi and some sort of a computer or tablet can potentially make money streaming something. It's not that easy. And right. I, I it, But it's kind of like, oh, I can be the next basketball star. I can be the next movie star. I can be the next singing star. Well, sometimes people... Not in any case specifically, but sometimes people aren't that good of singers. As we've seen with American Idol, for instance, people aren't that great of actors. And there needs to be a reality set. And so I, he seemed super into it, as, we, as he and I talked about in our conversation. And, you know, hopefully he can reach that. But I, I do think there's a lot of people this day and age, a lot of kids that think that's the answer. And mm-hmm. they're going to be rudely awakened when right. it's not the answer. And what it's- are they going to be able to do in those, in those moments? Same thing. It's like the top, what, 1% are acting and making the good money at it, are playing 
you know, baseball, basketball, football, what have you, and making them ex- excellent money at it. It's like you can shoot it over to YouTube. Maybe it's 2% there because it has a wider field of people. And Ethan, he streams the videos that, so he plays Fortnite and talks while he's playing. And that's what he gets streamed or whatever, however that works. And I've watched it and it's like, it's so boring. Like, how are people watching this? Well, I think people that like video games find it not boring. But I'm, I do struggle with that, too, because I'm not into it. I don't boring. get it. Okay, maybe. <laughs> still really boring. Like, it's not like he has funny comments and it's like you're waiting for the next funny comment. It's just like, you do this, you do that, you do this, you do that. Like, yeah, I can see why, like... My mom watches it because it's her grandkid. Mm -hmm. I watched it a few times just to make sure there wasn't cursing and whatnot involved. But it's not something I would seek out. Overall, then, with your your family setting, when you're home on a given day, do you feel good that things are going to go well? Or are you kind of on edge that something's going to happen all the time? Um, I play it by ear. I don't want to... I feel like you prove yourself right whether you feel something's going to go wrong or whether you don't feel something is going to go wrong. So I just play it by ear and take it one day at a time when Ethan's pretty good now at removing himself, himself from a situation that's making him mad. Um, and he has gone, we have an extra room downstairs as well. His room is upstairs. So if he's really being bothered, he'll go downstairs. He'll like take his iPad and just go downstairs and lock himself in the room. And we, I do my best to keep the boys, the other two upstairs, or I have on occasion, like taken us and left the house. Mm -hmm. So then he's, and he's obviously old enough to be by himself. So to give him that space where there really isn't anything else going on in the house and he can calm down. Um, we are a one eighty from where we were a year ago, even so, It's not as threatening as it was. I'll say it that way where he I don't feel like he's going to hurt anybody like he used to. Um, Not just punching holes in walls, but punching brothers and punching his mom and whatnot. So it's not to that level anymore. I I, I guess I don't know the details of any of these, but I know it's it's been against you at times. Yep. Uh, Describe some aspect of that, if you'd like, and just what that's like. To know that your son has this condition, which he acts in this this way and towards you and what it's like the next day trying to make sure everything seems as normal and positive as possible. Um, it's weird. It's definitely hard to, sorry. It's definitely hard to not hold a grudge, but it's your kid. Let's see. They've had, um, seven or eight felonies against him not just for me but at school with him um he broke smashed one of those um safety glasses that are between the doors like with all the wires in it he smashed up um their copier he's kicked and bruised teachers um my scariest one i'd say is well i still have a bite mark on my thigh which i still have a scar from And then um, the scariest one was I was making dinner and he was saying how he wasn't going to eat what I was making. And that's fine. Then you can make what you want to make. You know, you can make your own dinner. Then this is what I'm making. And he got mad and he took it was a metal. Do you know those toys that have the metal rods and like you put put it down and like the thing rolls and then you put it back up and it rolls the other way. They're like, they're old toys. I can't picture it, but go on. So he took that metal thing and whipped it at me and it hit me in the eye and I was black for a while. So like scared I was going to lose my vision and I've had to call the cops on him, which is awful to call it on your own son. And he, um, Sorry, he's also, um, I can't say it's been anything against Cameron, um, but one of the times he did take a rock and hit Anakin in the forehead and left like a big um, 
egg on his forehead. So I had, I called the cops to make sure that he was going to be okay. But that's, and he's been in juvie. He's been incarcerated in um, Carver County because Scott County doesn't have a kid's facility in their jail or whatever it's called. He was kicked out of the JAF, which is the juvenile facility down the road from us because he just takes off. Um, so all the cops know us by name, which is not always a good thing. No. Molly, as I do with all my guests, I ask them to participate in my being wrong segment. Is there something that you feel right now that a previous version of yourself, that you could tell that previous version of self that they were wrong and there's a different approach that you would now take? I would say with Ethan, just arguing less, um, right or wrong, there's no, not going to be a winner especially if he's slamming doors and getting angry and bent out of shape. Um, Davey is excellent, super excellent at calming everything down and taking it down a notch. And so taking his doing what Davey does, what would Davey do (laughs) would be the better. I would tell myself that more. What would Davey do? Do you find yourself argumentative with, with other people, uh, maybe Heck as yes. much as Ethan? Heck yes. You just like to like to argue. I like to stir the pot. Yeah. But I don't need to with my 13-year-old. Yeah, I suppose that makes sense. I That's something I feel like I've been learning too. Like Sometimes I want to just argue a point to argue a point, uh, either to be right or to make it more interesting, mm-hmm. stirring the pot. But I, I do feel like in moments now, occasionally, I'll just react with like, Mm, I'll just let it go. No big deal. I don't need to say something every time someone says something that makes me feel like I want to say something. (laughs) So it might be a good lesson to learn. Yep. Molly, thank you for taking the time with me today. Thank you, Kurt. Thanks for listening to People I Know Show. If you check the show notes, you'll see a link to Ethan's YouTube page where you can view what he does online and offer him some feedback. My reference to high aspirations, low expectations was in reference to the late Mark Weber. I've linked to his book, Tell My Sons, in the show notes. A reminder, please take a few moments to rate and review People I Know show on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I've heard that perhaps reviews that you've left haven't appeared yet. So if you have left a review, please contact me another way so I can get a better sense of how many people might have experienced this and maybe they're just not showing up. Remember, you can search for and follow People I Know Show on Facebook or Instagram to see photos, videos, and interact with the podcast or interact with me directly. If you like the show, please encourage someone new to listen or share your favorite episode on social media. And feel free to email your feedback directly to me, Kurt Carstensen, by using the email address peopleiknowshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.